information uh, a knowledge of self. For instance, if the average so-called Negro, he doesn't think that he can uh, go into business and provide jobs for himself. See, Jumbo, everybody, we welcome you to Satoris Black History Corner Internet Program. I am your host, Catherine Hunter Williams, along with my co host, Miss Catherine Blake, or also known as Miss B. Hello, everybody. And that's Miss B to me, not to y'all, okay? Hallelujah, because I don't want nobody coming to you. Hey, Miss B! <laughs> <laughs> you know, like AB on, uh, uh -huh. uh, what's the name? Uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, uh -huh. I was just watching him the other night, Opie and them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Andy Griffith. Andy Griffith show. Ain't B. They trying to get her to get married and everything. And Ain't B don't want to get married. You know, she got some of the saddest looking eyes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it was funny. So I just, I said, that's why I said this to say that Miss B is what I call her. I don't want, that's not for nobody else to call her. It's just a name that I gave her to make it short rather than just say it. Miss Catherine Blake, I just say Miss B. <laughs> All right. Before we go any further, I wanted to clear up some things about my guest that was on our program, on our last program, Mark Baldwin. And he was talking about Flint's water. First off, I want you to know that he works for the city of Flint. And he could not really tell us all the truth about the Flint water, what's going on with it and everything. Because he works for Flint, he is for Flint. So, hey, that's the way it had to go. I didn't find out this information until later. He also is a Native American, and he pushes rainwater. That's why on the program he kept talking about rainwater mm -hmm. and everything. And he has an upcoming workshop later about the use of rainwater at Kettering, and we'll let you know about it. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I just wanted to clear those things up. And then we, I had offered three solutions to bottled drinking water. Uh, a commercial water treatment for your entire home, which could cost a little bit of money. A little bit. <laughs> well, yeah. some people can afford it. We just yeah. one of those that. Yeah. I ain't going to never say I can't afford it because, hey, you don't know what the Lord has in store for me. That's true. If I say, Lord, I need this, I believe he will provide. All right. All right. A pure filter, P-U-R filter, or other filters that you could put on your faucet, which you can buy at Walmart, and as he stated, Rainwater. So that was three solutions we came up with to uh, give you an option against uh, buying all that bottled water. Mm -hmm. And Miss Blake was talking about um, where's all that plastic going? Where's all those bottle plastic bottles? Yeah. Where are they going? Yeah. Because they don't break down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, I want to say that the city council voted to go back to using Detroit's water, but that new manager they got. Uh, Emergency manager, manager mm -hmm. James Ambrose, said no. 
They wanted to do it until they could get that infrastructure mm -hmm. fixed so they could get us some good water. The council has really no, no power. They can vote and whatever, but that emergency, the city emergency manager has the power. Has the power. Uh, by the way, um, I'm going to interject here. I usually don't, but... Um, it's yes, like, you do. Well, yes, yeah, you do. Hold on, this, um, well, the past few weeks I haven't, but uh, the other day I ran into a woman just yesterday, and she used to work for the Flint Water Department. You know, she, I met her just on uh, the walks. I take my dog, and she was there. Me and my friend talked to her for a while, and uh, she said there was a move 30 years ago to actually, 30, 40 years ago, to get our own. And we had bought the property out there in Port Huron, you know, off of Port Huron to actually bring the water in. Mm -hmm. But they kept on stalling it and stalling it, and they kept on just making contracts with Detroit until the money dwindled. So basically, it, was, it wasn't it was people looking further ahead. And it's basically what I've been saying. You know, it's people 30, 40 years ago should have been looking down the road saying this is going to be an aging structure. And that's a problem with our leadership. They're just caught up in the stuff of the day, and they don't really concentrate on anything beyond the, the day, you know. And she said that's what happened is the, the, the money just basically dwindled. They had the money to build it 30, 40 years ago. Wow. Well, aren't they building a pipeline now? They're building it now, but then, you know, there's like a stall too now. I mean, it's yeah, like it's stalled. pay for it. And they're making us pay. I mean, it's like, you know, basically our water rates are still going to go up after completion. They're saying it's anywhere to 30 or 40 percent further beyond what the, the rates are now. That's absurd. Oh. You know, and the federal government does, you know, we they should be reallocating some of the funds that we've been paying for decades to right. D.C. back to the, I mean, I'm not a government inventionalist. I think the government screws things up. But we've been paying them for years for stuff we have not, never will or never will receive. Mm -hmm. And they should have been kicking money back to us years ago. Well, that's like when uh, they knew General Motors was going to leave here and they didn't do any diversity, didn't bring in other businesses. They knew it was going to happen. Well they, well, they knew, like, when I was graduating from high school back in 1981, they, we, I knew the job I was trained for. I was trained to be a welder in high school that basically wasn't going to be there four years after I got out of school. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why, one of the reasons why I didn't even plan on going into welding. But, I mean, we knew about this demise. I mean, that was planned. It w they can't say it just came up on us. No, it didn't. You know? and, and what got me is all they got downtown basically is restaurants. You and, know, and it's a, and they always develop that four block radius, five block radius downtown. That's all the planners care about. Well, is that uh, that uptown development who has well, well, they, the, a uh, lot of property downtown well, they, and they make a lot of decisions downtown? That's like all. When they, that's what they do. The, that's your taxes. The city of Flint taxes pay for the Genesee Tower building, well, and they got it for one dollar. Yeah, see, it's it's very. Come on, it's, that's messy. I gotta give them this. So these guys are prepared and they're ready to launch as soon as they can. I mean, I don't know who they all are. I really don't. I don't know if anybody really does. I mean, they claim they know the membership, but I gotta give them this. They're they kept something going in Flint, but it gets, something's gotta be built beyond four block radius, four or five blocks on North uh, South Saginaw Street. Mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise you're not gonna have some sustainability of the I city think at all. There should be more diversity down there. That's my thing. I mean, like economic diversity and you know business economic. Yeah, I believe that too. Yeah. I think there should be pockets within every side of town there should have you know grocery stores restaurants i don't think you should have to just go down downtown that's absurd yep and it's a lot of uh, uh it's a lot of uh area downtown you know you, they got the side streets and everything all that could be built up you know just bring some more diversity downtown because it's certain restaurants that are getting all the. It's just restaurants a lot down but there to me. I, I got to give them credit. As much as I, di I have disagreement with the down, you know, the DDA or whatever, but they have actually, they saw something further enough out to actually be able to plan ahead, so they can actually be in a position to move into it. So I mean, that's something that the our city father, you know, city fathers didn't do, or you know, they didn't do the, anything. Like I mean, basically, all these people want to do is, have, who do we have in office? They, what are their qualifications to be in that office? Basically, they just got enough votes. They don't have any business. I know sometimes they continue to keep the same people in office. So, you know, sometimes these people don't believe in change. And I think sometimes at my age, let somebody younger come in with new ideas. New ideas. You know, the different perspective, yeah. everything. So let's just, we just got to keep moving forward. I just, and that's just what I believe as some of these people that's my age want to stay there. You know, like, can't nobody else do nothing but them, but that's not And they should the not truth. be that way. Yeah, but it is. They A lot of things shouldn't happen yeah, that's know. going on in this world. Jesus Christ. It just hurts their feelings when they feel they got to go somewhere else and let somebody else take over, and they do a better job. <laughs> <laughs> and it won't be that it's better. It'll just be something new. And sometime, yeah. and sometime it's something, you know what they say, old is new again. Mm -hmm. So, no. Mm -hmm. Anyway. 
Anyway, I want to just clear that up, and we did get some more information from John. John is our producer, and he interjects on the program, which I also call him my historian because between him and George and this woman, wow, I got it going on. No, oh, I got it going on with y'all. It ain't just, I can't do this by myself. I have to have some help. So we when do. yeah, when he uh, interjects in the program, it always mm -hmm. enhances the program. Thank you, John. All right, let's get back to it because I don't know what time we started, but I know we don't have a lot of time. Okay, we hope you all had a wonderful and and glorious Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Remembering what did what Jesus did for us up on the cross. Amen. But I also want to say, would y'all stop saying Easter? Just right. just stop that word because if they. Jesus' death had nothing to do with bunnies and eggs mm -hmm. and rabbits and all that kind of stuff. So just please <laughs> stop it and re realize that when they're using Easter, it's commercialized. Mm -hmm. You know, you run out and buy clothes for Easter. This is the only time you might go to church that one time of the year. Wow. You know, it's all commercial. You go and spend money on groceries. It's a ripple effect. So stop using it and get to the real deal. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. Amen. All right. Moving forward. Amen. 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 <laughs> Today I'm going to tell our story about Henry Bibb and the resisting slavery, the oh, state of wow. Michigan only historical marker in Flint that recognizes Flint's involvement in the abolitionist movement and Underground Railroad activity. Amen. And Miss B will tell us a little about our story about Miss Ethel Payne. Mm-hmm. And she's going to give to you three young ladies who was on Black Girl Rocks. Oh, okay. Didn't you say you was going to do that? You're not? Oh, okay. okay. You I was going to recognize them? Yeah, recognize them. Okay. Okay. If you want to wait, we can wait. Yeah, I thought we were going to wait with... Uh, Until we get some pictures? Yeah, pictures and... And that'll be out. next yeah. month, though. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, well, move it forward. Let's move, move it forward. on. Let's move it on then. Okay. Let me tell you about the State of Michigan Historical Marker that's located downtown on the, uh, oh, Jesus, it's on the north lawn of the Genesee County Courthouse Building located between South Saginaw Street and Beach Street right on the corner of Court. It is the only state of Michigan historical marker in the city of Flint that recognizes uh, what abolitionists and the underground, that Underground Railroad activity took place here in the city of Flint. I'm very proud of this because the reason it's here is because of a little blurb in a book that I wrote called The, the Stop the Underground Railroad in Flint, Michigan. And it had a little blurb about this, this man named Robert Cromwell. Mm -hmm. And we did a uh, we did research. The Mott, Roof Mott Foundation hired us to do some research, and we uh, went all around the state of Michigan trying to find out this information uh, about Robert Cromwell, and we finally found it. And by that happening, that's how we got the state of Michigan marker. Robert Cromwell was a fugitive slave who uh, lived in the city of Flint as a free man. You hear what I said? Because at that time, during that time, uh, before they made that the Fugitive Slave Law Act, I think that was in 1850. Was it 1850, John? I think it's 1850. Yeah, I think it was before, just the uh, 10 years out before the Civil War started, 10, 11 years. 1850. Yeah. And, uh, it, but he lived here in the city of Flint. Okay, I done lost my sound. Hello? You still, you still, you're still being oh, heard. Oh, I'm still there because yeah, yeah, I wasn't heard. hearing me. Yeah. Okay, he... Um, Jesus, let me get my train back. I thought, people, I lost it because I can't. I still can't hear me through the, the mic. I don't know what's through, through, through what it. Anyway, let it go. Let it go. Okay. Ah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I still can't hear nothing. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh Lord. Okay, let me get back to it. Uh, at, during that time when Robert Cromwell had escaped to the city of Flint, he um, opened up a barber shop here and lived as a free man, as a barber. And during that time, the people here in the city of Flint didn't play that about having slave catchers coming here to take people back to the South. They didn't deal with that at all. 
Not at all. This is not a story that I haven't told you before, because like I said, I'm very proud of that marker, and I thank God that the opportunity came through me to be able to even have one here mm -hmm. that's sitting downtown, and it's, the name of it is called Resisting Slavery. On the other side, of it, also with Robert Cromwell, there is uh, Josiah, Governor Josiah Beagle, who they said had a, uh, under, he was a conductor on the Underground Railroad, and that the house was located on the corner. This is so ironic to me, because the house was supposed to be located where that church, United mm -hmm. Methodist Church, right there on the corner of Beach and and Court Street, that, Court Street that was supposed to be his house. It was a house. His house was built there. The church was behind it. Mm. Okay. So we did all that research, and, and basically I did it and found it out and put it in my book. And There's a marker there too, isn't it? Yeah, for the church, yeah. 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 But uh, by him being governor of the state of Michigan, it had to be kept a secret. Mm -hmm. So there is no... No paper or nothing around that said that he was a, a conductor. But his family, the Lay family, has been talking about this for hundreds of years. And once it becomes uh, been spoken about and passed from generation to generation, it becomes fact. Mm -hmm. Now, that's my understanding. What everybody else say, that's their issue and not mine. Because my research said that he was. And also, um, what is his name? He wrote The Iron Poor. Um, Banner. John, what, John, do you know what Mr. Banner's name was? Okay, his name was Banner. And he had wrote a book. And actually, he the one who gave me the book. And that's how I, I was reading it, and I got to sniffing and it said, he the one who said that there was an underground railroad. Um, and it was, uh, the conductor was Governor Josiah Beagle. And so that got me, not my nose going, and I got to sniffing around and it took a long time, like 16 years of research, to finally find that information that there was an Underground Railroad stop here in the city of Flint. And I found that out at the Second Avenue Baptist Church downtown Detroit. Mm -hmm. They called me from Lansing and said, hey, Catherine, they didn't open it up. And what they did, they had a mitten, you know, the state of Michigan, and it had routes. What well, they called this uh, Flint Route 6. Well, back in those days, it was called trails. Mm. because it was Indian trails. There was mm -hmm. no driving, no, no, right. no, you know. In fact, these streets that we ride on now was Indian trails mm -hmm. that's been turned into expressways and <laughs> byways and highways. But anyway, um, that was the information that's on, the, on one side, that's on the front side, and as you see Robert Cromwell, and how we discovered it is we found a advertisement of his business and how he... Um, had to leave Flint because his daughter was uh, uh, still enslaved and he wanted to get her out of enslavement. So he sent a letter to try to purchase his daughter. Mm. And uh, the, the, uh, the man, uh, his uh, master, as it was called, got the letter and he seen, in fact, Robert Cromwell had seen where he had made a mistake because where they had stamped it uh, from Flint, Michigan. Oh. You know how the post office do? Mm -hmm. And that's when he, oh, my God. And then he left Flint. He ended up in Detroit. But there's a whole nother story about Robert Cromwell. Go down there and read it. It's all on the, on the marker. Then on one, the other side of it is Henry Bibbs, Henry Walton Bibbs, who was also another um, a fugitive slave. And he came from Cat Catalonia, Kentucky. And he was born May 10th, 1815. He was an American author, an abolitionist who was born a slave. After escaping from slavery to Canada, he found an abolitionist paper called The Voice of the Fugitive. Mm. He returned to the U.S. and lectured against slavery. Henry Bibb was married. This is the thing about, see, they always said that slaves didn't have love within them, that they were not human and they weren't capable of loving. Henry Bibb would go back into slavery to get his wife. Mm. The issue was, one of them he went back to get, one thing too about it, they, they married quite a bit, you know. <laughs> they married a few times. But he went back in to get his wife. He loved his wife so much, he was free. Mm -hmm. He had ran away, he had got away, but he went back into slavery to get his wife. The issue that one of the wives he went back to get is uh, she, the, the, the master had taken her. 
and she mm-hmm. refused to go with him. But he was, he loved his wife. He went back to get her. You put yourself in danger when you go back into slavery. Mm-hmm. He could have uh, got caught there or whatever. But anyway, he was um, born uh, to an enslaved woman named Mil- Mildred Jackson on a plantation in Catalonia, Kentucky. His people told him his fa- his white father was James Bibb. That's where he got his name. You know, that's what they did mm-hmm. during s- enslavement. They uh, whoever had whoever your master that was your last name. Mm-hmm. Ain't that something, boy? But anyway, uh, Henry never knew him. As he was growing up, Bibb saw each of his six younger brothers and sisters all sold away to uh, other slaveholders. In 1833, Bibb married another mulatto slave. This is the woman, Melinda, who lived in Oldham County, Kentucky. They had a daughter named Mary Frances. And y'all can get his book. It's called Henry Bibb. Just get his book, The Narrative and Life and Adventures of Henry Bibb, and read about the love that he had for his wife. Because I don't have a lot of time to go off into it, but it is summertime. Well, springtime, summer's coming, and warm days are ahead. Yes, so go downtown, down to the Genesee County Courthouse on the north line. You can actually see it when you're riding down Saginaw. If you just look, it says resisting slavery. And if you go inside, uh, and when you go through, and you know you can't take cell phones in the county courthouse anymore, but if you go inside, and once you go through security and turn quickly to your right, you will see a collage, uh-huh. and you will see uh, Governor Josiah Beagle. Now, we didn't, could, couldn't get no pictures of um, Robert Cromwell, but you will see the advertisement that he had for his barbershop. Now, these are two men that I've told you our story about that were fugitive slaves and lived as free men. Uh, let me see here. Let me get just a little bit more. In 1842, he managed to flee to Detroit from where he hoped to gain the freedom of his wife and his daughter. That's the one I'm telling you about. He kept going back down there and putting himself in danger to try to get them. The issue is, after finding out that Melinda had been sold as a mistress to a white planter, Bibbs focused on his career as an abolitionist, and he traveled throughout the, uh, and lectured throughout the United States. He went back to get her, but she was gone. She was sold to a white planter. So he just he eventually left alone. But like I said, you can read about this in his book. In 1849 through 1850, he published his autobiography, Narratives of the Life and Adventure of Henry Bibb, an American Slave, written by himself, which became one of the best-known slave narratives. And slave narratives is where um, slaves tell about what happened in their life. They just tell the story, or our story as we want to call it, uh, of the antebellum years. The passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, it was of 1850, John, increased the danger of Bibb, to Bibb and his second wife, Mary uh, E. Miles of Boston. It required Northerners to cooperate in the capture of escaped slaves, even though, like I told you before, in Flint, they did not like slave catchers, and they would run them out of town. They didn't mm. care for that at all. That's why uh, uh, Robert Cromwell lived like he did as a free man, because he had protection. Mm-hmm. To ensure their safety, the Bibbs migrated to Canada and settled in Sandwich, Upper Canada, now Windsor. I didn't know that. Windsor, Ontario. Mm. And that's our story about mm. Robert Cromwell the uh, resisting slavery state of Michigan historical marker that recognizes um, abolitionist movement and the uh, Underground Railroad activity took place here. Some awesome things have taken. Flint, it, Flint has put a lot of things on the map. Mm-hmm. A lot of things started right here in Flint and was put on the map because of the things they've done. Well, what about your book, The Stop? With all that information in it, I, I know it's out of print right now. Are you it is out of print. About, uh, I, I want to do another one because we did so much research mm-hmm. and found out much more information about the Underground Railroad and abolitionist movement. Mm-hmm. I just, it's, like I said, I tell people I got seven books in me. Mm-hmm. I just got to sit down and do it. Mm-hmm. That's all. <laughs> 
but that is a, that would be part two or something like mm -hmm. that, or or I would name it a Trail Six because, like I said, down in Detroit on that wall, and I don't know if they still have that Underground Railroad station. It is amazing to go into one of those just to see the stuff that they have mm -hmm. in an Underground Railroad uh, station, you know. And up on the wall, how they had their, the strategy mapped out and everything, and how they was going to take these people mm -hmm. from one place to another, which from Detroit they would take them to uh, our route, six up to upper, mm -hmm. upper uh, Michigan. And then they would cross over to Canada. Like I got a map right in front of me. They would cross over to Canada from up there, but then some of them would come back around and go out through Port Huron. Mm -hmm. So I like to go around telling that story because I have some. Uh, some things that I carry with me, like a slop jar, which a lot of our people don't know about, but some of us oh, older sure people, remember. we know about slop jars. <laughs> you know, and then other things that they had in an underground <clears throat> railroad station. So, uh, and, it's, and it's called Resisting Slavery. That's the name of the exhibit mm -hmm. that I have and I t carry around with and uh, enjoy uh, teaching, especially young people and sometimes older people because some of them, like, my children's age or their children don't know about a slop jar. Mm -hmm. They don't know about uh, medicine that they would give that uh, asphenesis, I think it was. Mm -hmm. you How remember? about cow chip tea? Oh, tea. <laughs> uh, but they had clothing and shoes and stuff. Can you imagine running from the south with no shoes on right. and then get up here and it's snow and it's cold? Mm -hmm. But there's this is very interesting uh, the Underground Railroad the routes and everything they did even someone would get to Detroit mm -hmm. and would swim across the Hudson uh, Huron I'm sorry the H Huron River to mm -hmm. the other side of Canada in freezing water so it's got some awesome it's some awesome stories with it so I'm just telling y'all that it's springtime summer is coming get you mm -hmm. your children your grandchildren and take them down to see this, uh, mm -hmm. the marker, and then go inside, and then you can get more history because it's a collage in there that has pictures with other people that were Underground Railroad conductors or abolitionists that came to the Genesee County Courthouse and spoke against slavery. Flint was one of those cities that was not for slavery. So that's our Amen. story. And I hope y'all go and see it. And I, I don't know, like I said, I think we got 10 minutes, John. We started late. We got a few more minutes. You want to you wanna cover that other person? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you, can you hear me? Now, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So, yeah, you got a few more minutes, yeah. Okay. All right. All right, Miss B, let me let you get your move right. on and tell our story about Miss Ethel Payne. Miss Ethel Payne. She was born on August 14, 1911, and she passed. She met her ancestors May 28, 1991. <clears throat> she was an African-American journalist known as the First Lady of the Black Press. She was a columnist, lecturer, and a freelance writer. She combined advocacy with journalism as she reported on the civil rights movement during the 50s and the 60s, and she became the first female African-American commentator employed by National Network, CBS. Yes. CBS hired her in 1972. And in addition to her reporting of American domestic politics, she also covered international stories. She was born in Chicago, Illinois, as Ethel Lois Payne began her journalism career rather unexpectedly while working as a hostess at the Army Special Services Club in Japan, a position she had taken in 1948. Did you say she was the first first black woman at work with the press? It says she became the first female African-American commentator okay. employed by a national network, which was CBS, in 1972. But was she... Uh, one of the writers of press because I going through her history I seen where she was with presidents and talking to yep. them and she was a columnist a lecturer a reporter and a freelance writer okay she was one of the first mm -hmm. she was the first woman because I'm sure it was a man that was a reporter also before mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. or or during her time but as far as I know she's the first 
That's what it says. I mean, that's what her history that made her history that way, right? First female African American commentator. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. While she was in Japan, a position she had taken in 1948. She allowed a visiting reporter from the Chicago Defender to read her journal, which detailed her own experiences as well as those of African American soldiers. Impressed, the reporter took the journal back to Chicago, and soon Payne's observations were being used by the Defender, an African American newspaper with a national readership as a basics for front page stories. And in the early 1950s, Payne moved back to Chicago to work full time with the Defender. And after working there for about two years, she took over the paper, One Person Bureau in Washington, DC. And in addition to the national assignment, Payne was afforded the opportunity to cover uh, over stories overseas, becoming the first African American woman to focus on international news coverage. There you go. I knew it was somewhere she was actual first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And during Payne's career, she covered several key events <clears throat> in the civil rights movement, including the Montgomery bus boycott and the desegregation at the University of Alabama in 1956, as well as the 1963 March on Washington. And at 19 and the 1956 Bandung Conference in Indonesia, she was the only black correspondent there. All right. In Indonesia. And it was something I think I highlighted on there, um, one of them pages on the back. So, okay. and I was gonna speak on it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's... Okay. Get the glasses. This age thing. It says, I was beginning to, or oh, this is her quote. Yeah, it's a quote. She said, I was beginning to feel that even though I couldn't get into law school, journalism was an effective way to carry out the kind of law that I would have liked to practice. So I did not regret being a journalism, being in journalism. I was then will continue to be the rest of my life an advocate journalist. Amen. And then she says, though there was plenty of prejudice against black reporters, I sometimes felt I was more at a disadvantage because of being a woman than being a black person. Anti-feminism was very strong. Sarah McClendon a white reporter had to be aggressive to survive. And the white reporters always, oh, that's how, I guess I was that pushy black, ooh, B-I-T-C-H. Oh. <laughs> oh, so she, that's how she got up in there. She, sometimes you have to, like I say, ruffle feathers or to stay smooth. Yeah, I had to ruffle some and feathers. And they call you, that word, uh -huh. yeah, but sometimes you have to be aggressive to get where you want to get as far as a woman is concerned. And she did have two strikes. Not that only mm -hmm. was she black, but she was a woman, woman. a black woman at that. So it's, it's, you know. Okay, they got her down here as the first lady of the black press. Right. That's what I thought she was. The first lady of, of the black press. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so awesome. That's a good story about her. And I liked her pictures that I got of her because mm -hmm. she she looks like she just had fun mm -hmm. <laughs> doing her thing, you know. Yes, yeah. she did. Amen. Okay. Ethel Payne. Ethel Lois Payne. Mm -hmm. Chicago Defender. And she's still alive? No, she passed. 1991. Okay. So she joined her ancestor during mm -hmm. that time. Okay, is that our story? That's our story. You're not going to mention nobody else? or no. Okay, we done now. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, John, I think we did that very timely with, uh, with the uh, little things that was happening, and I'm trying to hold up these. See, I'm trying to grow my hair, and I'm trying to get me a nice big fro like Miss B got. <laughs> Miss B got a bush going on, and I want me a nice, decent-looking fro. So when I put these 
these headphones on top of my head. It messes my hair up. So I'm holding them here like this, which works for me. Okay, <laughs> they won't mess up my hair. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Miss B. That was an awesome story. Amen. Our story about Ethel Payne. All right. On our next program on Monday, April uh, 27, we will have a conversation with our special guest, Priest Elliot McCant. Of why is there so much hatred in America for black people? Mm -hmm. And then I got some pictures, uh, John, and I don't know if uh, I got some... Uh, of these last few, from Rodney King to to this man, Walter Scott, that just got murdered, mm -hmm. that I would like to put up, you know, as we're talking, because that's hatred. That's That has a lot to do with hatred, just pure D hatred. And this last one where, the, you know, he didn't know he was on video. You know what I'm talking about, John? Mm -hmm. Carolina, yeah, I heard about it. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it. I mean, it's... I don't see how he can justify doing what he did. I mean, it's all on video. I mean, it's, yeah, it's... it got caught. And my thing is, I think that it's a lot of times that uh, this has happened, but it wasn't on video, and we never yeah, knew when they set him up. Everybody's got a camera on their cell phone now, so... So every, it's out there now. Ready. Yeah. Yep. But anyway, we look forward to having Priest Elliot McCants. And we'll probably more than likely speak about our black girls at rock our young girls, and the controversy that's going around about uh, our first lady, Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. and the hatred that was spit on her. Yeah. About... Venom. Uh, I call it yeah, Venom. Just she Venom. she wanted to recognize these three young ladies that are really rocking. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Mm -hmm. Just giving our girls a boost. Yeah. To let them, they could, let them know that they, they could be it, something. Yeah. That they could do it also. And you you know, I was looking at it and I was looking when they would flash to the audience and look at these girls' faces in their eyes. And you could see the hope and, and, and aspiration that they had in their eyes if you just had watched the audience and I seen it, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's what that program does. It uplifts our Absolutely. girls. And Let them you, know. When I tell you the story of these girls, you will be amazed. If you saw black girls rot, then you already know. Yeah. All right. All right, we told our story about the resisting um, slavery marker and about Henry Bibb, about Robert mm -hmm. Conway, and Cromwell. And you'll get your book back out to stop or, uh, or an addition to it. It's going to be addition to it because now I know how to write a book. Mm -hmm. When I wrote that book, I didn't know how to write a book. Well, I just was there good job. just doing it, you know, and it was all about the research. Well, now I know, so it's just me now sitting down and doing it. It takes time to write a book, and you can't have no interruptions because you could be have a thought going. Somebody call, what you doing? I'm I'm writing the book, and they continue mm -hmm. to talk. Oh my good, the thought is gone. Mm -hmm. So you know now I learned to not answer the phone, let it just ring and do my thing, and I mm -hmm. learned to just sit down from now on and write every day, just a right. little bit or something. But uh, I have a a, a a a a formula of how I'm writing my books. It comes in a certain mm -hmm. order. And so right now I'm working on this one called Shua HaMashiach, the anointed Messiah of G Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's the one I'm right. I shouldn't have said that on here because I don't want nobody to take it. <laughs> but you never know. You can't do it like I can. So, hey. Anyway, let's move forward. I'm getting a book together, too. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. On uh, African-American women and their stories. I got some inf information for you if you want it. Yeah, I do. It's from uh, it's about uh, women here in a, in Flint. Oh, I need it. Yeah, I gotta find it, but I got it. Okay. It's about uh, women that worked in the factory and stuff like that. Okay. That's what it's about. Yeah. All right. Yeah, because I was gonna write a book about that too. Oh. Yeah. All right. I got some books in me. I collaboration, I see. I think I, I got a couple. Of a good collaboration me and her could do on that book. <laughs> I don't know if she want to collaborate with it. Yeah. Okay. Two, two, two Catherines. You could you, you could yeah, really, you go on the yeah. talk show and serve wow. to two Catherines. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. That's a good one because I do. I was gonna write a book myself about well, that. How well, many hands make it easier? I mean, many you know, two brains and two is uh, four hands typing away. I mean, it could you could really turn out something really quick. Yeah, I got pictures of them and everything I do too, because I, I did some. some uh, I, I worked in that field 
a long time ago, and I, at that time I was just collecting. The history was just given to me. You know? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I've been collecting and collecting. Yeah, collecting. but I think what you, you are you doing for Flint women? See, I was no, doing for women, Flint. Uh, you just doing for women, period. African American women. Okay. There, when I first started uh, research on African American women, it wasn't that easy to find uh, information. No, on, it's but, not. But uh, I am finding it now, and I say, but it's in different books. But I just want to have one book with a lot of ladies in there that did. Even the ones that are unsung heroes, you don't see books on them. Well, see, that's what my book was going to be about, unsung heroes, mm -hmm. black, American, African women in the city of Flint. Okay. But they worked in the factory, mm -hmm. you know. Well, and then I expanded, too. you know, so. Maybe I'll get a little section in your book. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's see. All right, so Taurus Black History Corner Internet Program comes to you every second and fourth Monday of the month at 3.30 p.m. Uh, starting, and, and also, make sure, I'm sorry, my glasses is doing a do. Also, be sure to watch what's going on with political pundit Dr. George Moss. He comes on every Monday at 2 p.m. As always, I like to say a sante, a Swahili word for thanks to all of you who have watched our program today. And if you have liked what you have seen and heard, please pass it on to others. I don't like to use the word please because it makes you like you're begging. And I shouldn't have to beg nobody to pass this on because this is a good program. We're giving you our story. We're telling you the truth. There's no lies in here. Now, we do do some emphasis of our own. But there's no lies being told to you. No whitewashing. It's straight up black history. And I love it. Amen. Or as I say, our black story. Amen. Yes. Until next time, my great and strong people, keep on keeping on with us. Hotep, which means peace. Bye. Centuries.